Ushma Neal, editor-at-large at the JCI, here with the delightful task of having a conversation with Dr. Lucy Shapiro from Stanford University for the next in our series of Conversations with Giants in Medicine. Shapiro is a renowned molecular and developmental biologist whose work has answered the fundamental questions underlying the genetic and molecular decision-making process that directs cells to split into two cells. Her insights helped launch the field of systems biology, and more recently, her work has led to the novel development of antifungal and antibacterial drugs. I hope we get a chance to hear more about your wonderful path through science and unique path through science. Can you start perhaps by telling me a little bit about your parents and where you grew up? I grew up in New York City, um, the child of immigrants. Uh, my father is from the Ukraine. Uh, and never had formal schooling, ever, uh, but a curious, intelligent man who managed to educate himself. My mother was first-generation American, also from the Ukraine, uh, and was a music teacher and a pianist. Everyone in my family was musical. Uh, so I was taking piano lessons, I think, at the age of four. Couldn't escape it. My piano teacher was my mother. Uh, and it became apparent to me with time that this was not my calling. And when it came time, we were in Brooklyn, and when it came time to go to high school, my local high school was, I think it was called manual training, and about 5% went on to college. And this was not what I was going to do. And so my parents said, well, there's the High School of Music and Art. You play the piano, you're, you know a great deal about music. And I said to myself, no, this is not what I want to do. And I remember going to the local library and getting out a book called How to Draw by John Nagy. And every night after lights out, I would crunch down in bed with my little flashlight and go through the book. Fortunately, I had some talent. I learned how to draw. And when I went up to music and art for my entrance exam, I said, no, I'm not doing it in music. I'm doing it in art. And here's my portfolio. And I got in. And when I had to explain to my parents that I got into music and art and would be going, but not in music, it was a family crisis. <laughs> uh, but that's what happened. And I must say that my four years at music and art were really absolutely amazing. But there is something else I want to add about my childhood and upbringing. And I have two sisters, uh, the eldest. And one of them, Enid, uh, is only 17 months younger than I. And she's brain damaged. And it was my responsibility to take care of Enid because both my parents worked. And I think that when you're a kid and growing up, this is life. You don't say, oh, woe is me, isn't this difficult? But looking back on it, I did not have a normal childhood. Do you think that part of that experience was what developed a fascination with things beyond art and music? No, I don't think it's that. Uh, what it did do was teach me how to multitask, teach me how to compartmentalize, teach me how to run things. <laughs> I know that sounds rather odd. But all my executive training was in managing my family. And it's not something people think about often. But it was very, very uh, pervasive in everything I did and thought about and carried on. So while you're at the High School for Music and Art, it's now known as LaGuardia, right? Yes. But when I was at Music and Art, we were up in Harlem near City College and it was called the High School of Music and Art, and it was incredible. Right, so while you were there, did you start to uncover like, the idea that perhaps science or math could be intriguing to you? Well, I was, very, I was a good student, and you know, whatever course I took, I did well in um, and I loved math. Uh, but I had a biology teacher, Mr. Merrillman, uh, that said, really got me intrigued. It was interesting. And I sort of put it away, because really what I did was paint. Uh, and, and I loved it. 
But that was the seed. That began it. And then when it came time for college, there was no way I could leave the city because I was embedded in my family. And furthermore, we couldn't afford anything. That was it. And fortunately, I was in New York City. And the schools were free. And Brooklyn College was absolutely wonderful. And when I entered, they had a brand new program, an experimental program called the Honors Program. And I think they were, we were about 10 guinea pigs. I don't know how on earth they chose me, but they did. And it meant that I could take anything I wanted. And I didn't have to attend classes. I had to pass the finals, but I could do whatever I liked. But I had a mentor, like a Don, and that's how I went to college. So I took a lot of things. Um, I had a double major in fine arts and in um, biology, really. Uh, and it was a wonderful experience. What was your thought while you were finishing college about what you were going to do next? Okay, so that's where interesting things happen. So my goal while I was doing art and biology was to become a medical illustrator. And while in college, I supported myself by illustrating all the coursework and all the syllabus stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm good. You know, I can draw. Then um, I finished all my coursework and could have graduated in three and a half years. And I was in a joint show in New York City, actually at Lever House. And there I met Ted Shedlovsky. Uh, Ted Shedlovsky was a physical chemist at Rockefeller University, and he had this thing about finding young people in the arts who he decided, I don't know, had a given mind that would do well in science, and he invited my husband at the time and myself up to Woods Hole where we spent a week, and I spent really a lot of time with Shedlovsky up there in Woods Hole with him asking me word problems. I'll never forget that. And I love word problems, so I was really good at it. At the end of the time I was there, he said, this is what you're going to do. <laughs> I said, really? He said, I want you to take a course now in organic chemistry. I had no background in chemistry whatsoever. And then I want you to get a job in some lab in the city so that you know what a lab is like. He really became a mentor. So I went to Brooklyn College office, this was, I think, June, and I said, do you have an organic chemistry course for this summer? And they said, well, we only have Professor Peach's honors organic chemistry course. How did you do in all your chemistry courses? I don't know if I should tell this story. Um, I said, well, I took chemistry, general chemistry, but I, I dropped out. I was only there a bit and I left but I forgot to drop it officially. So I had to take the final. And it was a multiple choice. So I circled all the Bs and I got a D. And so that's on my record, that's what you'll see. And this woman who was listening to me was horrified. And she, she says, well, you know, thank you very much for stopping in. And then out of his office came Dr. Peach. And he said, now I'm curious. Why on earth would you want to take my honors organic chemistry course? And I told him why. And he says, can you do this? And I looked him in the eye and I said, I'm very smart. <laughs> he said, all right, that's a challenge. And I took it. And to be perfectly honest with you, that was probably the defining moment in my life. Um, it was it being exposed to the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. Organic chemistry was amazing. Now, the way my mind works, I think it's called an eidetic memory, is um, I have a photographic memory. So if I see a page or write something down, I photograph it and I can see it. I can move molecules around in three-dimensional space easily and see it. So those two things for organic chemistry made it not hard. And, and I loved it. I really loved it. And then I knew that was it. I was going to do chemistry. And so, okay, checked off organic. And Ted said, okay, now you have to go find a lab. And so I applied to several, you know, technician jobs in the New York City area. And one of them was with Tom August and Jerry Hurwitz. 
They were then at NYU. That was before they moved up to Einstein. It was a really weird inter interview because I didn't know anything. <laughs> uh, and they hired me. And um, it, I came in as a technician. And at that time, Jerry had just discovered RNA polymerase and you know, all the beautiful biochemistry. And all the other jobs I had interviewed for, oh man, piece of cake. That, I didn't know what they were talking about. So it was going to be really a challenge. Uh, but I said yes to the hardest one, and that was working with Tom August and Jerry Hurwitz. By the way, both of whom died within the past few months, both of them. Uh, and it was an incredible experience. I remember the bay I was in at NYU was shared with some guy named Jacques Monod, who had just won the Nobel Prize, and he was supposed to be doing a short sabbatical with Jerry. He was not there very often. And his experiments weren't working because he was dripping his ashes into his test tube. Uh, but he was an amazing guy. And that was my first exposure to molecular biology. And that must have been just such a heady time of being a young artist with some background in science around these brilliant minds. It was incredible. And uh, it was scary. Uh, but it was, I can do anything. So then what made you decide to say, OK, I can do more than just be a research technician? Well, what happened, it happened very fast. Uh, we got a hold of the uh, RNA phage, F2, that Norton Zinder had just discovered. And uh, Jerry wanted to know, Tom August wanted to know, because this is his major thing, is there an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase? All, right, all the polymerases were based on copying DNA. And so they said, OK, here, go do the experiment. So I got a hold of the phage, grew it up. This was, again, a very defining moment in my life. And uh, infected E. coli with the F2 phage. And time after infection, I assayed for the polymerization of uh, radioactive nucleotides uh, into RNA from RNA. So uh, I did do this. And I got, I got RNA in the presence of DNAs with time. And I remember, as though it were today, Standing in the counting room, we had planchettes and a big counter, very different from now. And with time after infection, God damn it, I was making RNA. And it was a Saturday. No one was around except Minot. And I ran in there, and I didn't know who Minot was. And I pulled him into the counting room, and I said, look at that. I said, that is a new enzyme activity. And he said, boom. <laughs> Uh, this, is, this is indeed very exciting. Now you must immediately call up Professor Zinder and tell him what you've done. And Zinder is the final author on the paper. And that was it. Right. Uh, and I think very rapidly after that, um, Jerry and Tom said, you know, you should be a graduate student. And then, and then Jerry looked at my transcript. <laughs> he was equally horrified, you know. Fine arts, folk dancing. <laughs> oh, you did finally take organic chemistry. And I said, yeah, I got an A. Uh, and that was it. I was a graduate student, and that was my thesis. So this was at Einstein, because? Well, it started at NYU. It started at NYU. It started at NYU. And after a year, Einstein purchased our whole department. It was Bernie Harker's department. And we moved up to Einstein, the whole department or at least most of the department. OK, so you finished your PhD, and you decide you're going to go do a postdoc at Princeton. So when it came time to decide what kind of postdoc I wanted to do, I decided that physical chemistry was what I really wanted to do. And Kautzman at Princeton was doing just really beautiful work. And I didn't apply anywhere else, just applied to him. And yes, it was all set. I was going to Princeton. Uh, Harl uh, my husband and I got an apartment. We were ready to move. And then he had to go on a, an immediate sabbatical because his wife became very ill. So I was high and dry. And um, I spent some time in Julius Marmer's lab at Einstein, about six months. I actually published a paper on it. Uh, and at, at about that time, Bernie Harker, who was chairman of the Department of Molecular Biology that I had gotten my PhD in, uh, asked me to come back as a faculty member. And 
it was a Friday, and I said, I'll think about it and talk to you on Monday. <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> and so, okay, I'll do it. And Ari said, yes. And then Harker did something amazing, which I can't imagine anyone doing these days. He said, take three months to think. What is it that you want to do for the rest of your life in science? because you're interested in physical chemistry, you're interested in enzymology, you're interested in all kinds of biochemistry. And again, that was a very defining moment because, you know, think of the time. This was the 60s. All of molecular biology was exploding. I mean, we, we, all the stuff that we take absolutely for granted and our students today cannot imagine there was a time that they didn't know everything. Well, it was all being figured out then. And so I said, well, what is it that we don't know about? What is it that is very difficult to even begin to comprehend? And to me, there were two parts. One is positional information. We exist in a three-dimensional world. A cell knows where to put things. How does it know this? It's replicated. It must be encoded. But how? How is the information from a genetic code translated into three-dimensional space and remembered? And that to me was, to me, the, the big underlying question. Second, every time a cell divides, there have to be divisions that give you two different kinds of cells. Asymmetric division is the fundamental basis of speciation. It's the fundamental basis of what gives us all the forms of life on Earth that we know about. So what do we know about that first asymmetric division in which you have to read the genomes differently in the two cells? Those were my two questions. And then I had to find something to study. You know, what model organism would I possibly use? This was before um, recombinant DNA technology, before all the technologies that are now a piece of cake. And so I had to find a cell that was my hydrogen atom. I had to find a cell that was as simple as could be, yet demonstrated positional information that had an asymmetric division, every division, and yet could be manipulated and was simple. So how did you land on colobacter, in colobacter. colobacter instead of like an epithelial, like a mammalian? Well, I didn't want a mammalian cell. It was too complicated. And in my innocence, I thought a bacterial cell would be quite simple. It turns out that that's not true, but OK. You know, it was going to have a smaller genome. It was going to, I was going to be able to make genetics work. And I wanted something like my hydrogen atom, really simple. So I read a lot. And remember, I'm not a microbiologist. I was not a geneticist in any way. And in my reading, I hit upon colobacter, this gram-negative bug that at every division gave an asymmetric division. And it had polarity. So the cell, which is not unlike E. coli, it's a gram-negative bug, has a flagellum at one pole, it's sort of a curved rod, and a stalk at the other, thin appendage. And I said, this cell knows how to put something in the right place. And then when it divides, the portion of the cell that had a flagellum swims away. And the other portion that had a stalk sits down on something and eats. And then it goes through its cell cycle and every time it divides, it gives you a stalk cell and a swimmer cell. So it had the characteristics I needed. I was too naive to say, oh my god, there's no biochemistry, there's no genetics, you can barely grow this thing. Uh, but I decided that's what I wanted to do. And then I sat down and thought. And I wrote out a plan for the next 20 years of how I was going to dissect this cell from its genome 
through to everything it did during its cell cycle. In essence, what I wanted was in vivo biochemistry. And I realized then that I couldn't possibly just study each of these events without understanding how they impacted one another. And to me, that was the beginning of systems biology. And this happened in the you know, early 70s. And we went forward. So at that time, I can imagine the response was somewhat heretical to you challenging both experimental approaches as well as then the conclusions you were making. Yeah, well, I remember talking to Jerry about this, and I've said this before, but it's really true. I told Jerry my plans, and he looked at me horrified. He said, after all the training you've had as a quantitative biochemist, what you're talking about is drek. <laughs> and that in Yiddish is garbage. And I said, well, maybe not. I said, what I'm going to do is apply all my analytical training to understand how you incorporate this into a living cell. And there was one person who really did support what I was doing. And I spent many, many summers working at Cold Spring Harbor. And the one person was Barbara McClintock, who had a deep and abiding belief in knowing your organism. And uh, everyone laughed when I said I was going to work on Colobacter. They said, what? what? What is it? You know, they could barely, you know, abide by E. coli, not bringing in something as unknown and, you know, what could you possibly do with Colobacter? I said, well, it does what I want it to do. And she supported that. And that made a big difference to me. So we'll skip ahead a little bit in that you have had a number of fascinating discoveries, fantastic trainees that joined you, yes. such that then you got to the point where you were asked to take on an entire department at Columbia. Yeah, well, it's, that started sooner because at Einstein, I did become chair, acting chair of the department and then chair of the department. I think when I was 37 years old. Um, but remember I talked about my childhood and running this household and I learned how to run things easily. And my secret was knowing how to delegate, being able to assess who was capable of working on something that was difficult. Uh, and at the same time, knowing that the primary, my primary goal in life was my science and understanding how this bug worked. And all the other jobs I did were ancillary. My science, my lab came first. If I had some organization thing to do but a paper to get out, that paper got out. And I've done that my whole life. And I found that I was pretty good at making decisions, delegating, running things. And it's never been anything that has taken over my life. It is not my passion. My passion are my experiments. Well, then after, after running departments at Einstein and Columbia, yes. you and your family decamped for California. Yeah. Yes, I, I remember California. when I told Richard Axel that I was, I was leaving New York and moving to Stanford. Richard looked at me and he said, remember not to breathe any air you can't see. <laughs> um, and I moved to Stanford. Um, actually, we camped across the country. Um, as a New Yorker, I had never been in a sleeping bag in my life. And camping was, you know, I looked at my husband, I said, are you mad? Uh, but, you know, he's a Texan. And he said, well, you got you to gotta see the country. And he did an amazing thing. Uh, Harley was a department head at Bell Labs, a physicist. And we, you know, I really was very anxious about this decision to move. But to me, Stanford was Mecca. And so since then, he kind of shifted gears oh, yes. and has joined you. That's right. So, well, didn't really join me. He was quite independent. Um, first, he got a job working in the aerospace industry. 
uh, dealing with signaling from Earth to satellites. That's important because the signaling from X to Y is what we ultimately did together. And he came to a seminar that Ira Herskowitz gave, a very great yeast geneticist who unfortunately died young. And I remember at the end of Ira's talk, he had on the board all these genes connected by arrows and bars and feedback loops and you know, an incredible number of feedback loops who few people could figure them out except Ira and Harley. And uh, it was then, I think, that Harley decided that we were doing amazing stuff. And by then, I had worked out with my incredible cadre of students and postdocs a lot of the genetic circuitry that ran the cell cycle and connected all these various events. And Harley sort of had an aha moment and said, what runs a cell is an integrated system not unlike electrical circuitry. And I said, oh, are you interested in that? He said, yeah. We did something unusual. Even though we were two separate labs, we physically combined them because we needed a complete interdisciplinary approach. And in any given bay, we'd have a physicist sitting next to a geneticist, a, an engineer sitting next to you know, a cell biologist or biochemist. And our group meetings, oh my god, they were amazing. You served as a White House advisor on bioterrorism during the peak years, especially of the anthrax scares. And you've met now three presidents. So two questions, what's it like to meet a president? And what do you see in a more scientific vein as our major bioterror threats? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to take this question a little differently. And what I'm going to, well, first of all, it's amazing meeting these people. Okay, we'll leave, leave that at that. Um, but why? Why did I become interested in it? And what did that lead to? Yes. So at about mm, a little before 2000, uh, I became aware of two very, very important things. Number one, antibiotic resistance was just taking over. And this was terrifying. And I don't think enough people were worried enough. Number two, because of the way the world population was deployed and moving, we were getting more and more infectious agents in places where they never were before. So that's the second thing. The third, in what I call the perfect storm, was that the large pharmaceutical houses were not focusing on making new antibiotics and new antifungals at a time when we desperately needed that and new diagnostics. And again, I sat down and I thought, well, what can I do? How can I help this? And I decided on, a, again, a three-pronged approach. And I decided, number one, I would give as many talks as I possibly could in many different venues. It was on NPR. I would talk at high schools. I would talk anywhere to have people understand that we had a very serious problem. Number two, it occurred to me that the message had to be convey to people in power. Somehow I had to get to Washington. And you know, being at Stanford helped because they have connections everywhere. So that was my second goal. And the third, because I had sat on the board of directors of Smith Klein Beecham, I was on the board of directors of Glaxo Smith Klein, I knew how things worked, not only in the large pharmaceutical firms, but also in, in biotech. And I said, you know, I know how to do this. And one of my good friends who I met from these advisory boards was a, just a visionary biochemist named Steve Benkovic, who was at Penn State, still is at Penn State. And I remember sitting down with Steve and I said, let's design new antibiotics and new antifungals and let's do something and go into it in a way that nobody else has. I said, let's make a whole new chemical space. And not many people, but Steve did, said, sure, let's see what we can do. 
So we got out the periodic table and we said, well, what's below carbon? Boron. What do we know about boron? Well, it's out there in the world, you know, it's not killing people. And so we decided, we, actually the person who did the chemistry was Steve, uh, to make a library of small molecules based on borum on the active site and not carbon. And I had, back at my lab at Stanford, you know, an array of cells and pathogens from, you know, HeLa cells, which we didn't want our compounds to affect, to all kinds of yeast cells and other fungi, to all kinds of bacterial pathogens. And he sent me a representative library and I tested everything. We had incredible activity. Some was specific for yeast, none touched HeLa cells, others were for different bacterial pathogens, gram-negative and gram-negative. And I said, Steve, we've got something here. And I said, but first we have to do the critical experiment. Replace the boron with carbon. Can we do that? And he did, and we lost all activity. And so we immediately pulled our resources and hired a lawyer, and we got the intellectual property on this library. And uh, at that time, just at that time, 2001 hit, and the anthrax scare, and everything dealing with terrorism grew. And for us, that meant that the government was now clearly very excited by what we had. I had compounds for anthrax and tularemia and all kinds of things. And so they gave us a lot of money. And it also came home to me that I better know about all of this. So I learned about this. And um, I got invited because of several people, including Craig Venter, who knew Bill Clinton, to address the cabinet with Clinton. And I did, and I remember facing all these guys in the cabinet room, and I had five minutes, right? We were all very constrained to five minutes. And Clinton said, well, how can we deal with, with bioterrorism? I said, you know, I said, there's a bigger problem. What is it? And I wound up talking and giving a, practically a class for 20 minutes to this crowd. We formed a company called Anacor. Steve and I, uh, and it grew into quite a large company. Uh, we had the first new uh, antifungal and new mechanism of action in about 50 years. And it was, we brought it all the way through to the market. And then one of our drugs was pretty effective against strep. And kids that have atopic dermatitis or eczema get a super infection with strep. And we knew that our compounds were totally non-toxic. So we did a lot of, a, a huge trial with children with eczema. And it worked okay as an antibiotic for the strep, but then the docs started calling in who were running these trials and said, you know, what the hell is this stuff? The inflammation is going away. And if you're very involved in a company, you can say, okay, everybody stop what you're doing and let's get mechanism of action. Why, why is this compound affecting the inflammation. And it turned out it was a PDE4 inhibitor. And that gave us Eucrisa. That is now on the market. Um, we had finished a phase three trial. It's a, as effective as a steroid. And, and you don't have to slather your babies with a steroid. Uh, and um, Pfizer bought us. And, and they brought it to market. And then Steve and I were faced with the fact that, okay, we made a lot of money. Uh, what now? And what I wanted to do with that, well, first I bought a sports car. But then we said, what do I want to do with that? And I thought about agriculture. And one of the huge problems of climate change is that we have the movement of infectious agents to places where they were never before. We have increased fungal infections of our food crops. We have uh, places that are going through droughts at the same time that other places are going through floods, all affecting agriculture, all affecting the entire landscape of the distribution of pathogens of all kinds that infect not only livestock and humans, but our plant food. And I said, we're going to go into agriculture. 
So we start, no one said, you know, we don't know anything about agriculture. So we started Borgen. And at Borgen is now based in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. And we worked with a, um, an accelerator because we didn't know what to do. And it's cooking. And we have compounds that are highly effective against soybeans, rust, banana blight, uh, many, many different multifunctional stuff. And so that's going as well now. There is nothing you can't do. So well, <laughs> now that's not true. It's all part of what we do. It's being brave enough and gutsy enough to try to move into an area that you've not been in before and learn about it and, and apply to medicine, to feeding the planet, what we know how to do. And, and you don't have to change the world. You can just apply the little things that you know. I know chemistry. I know how to inhibit an enzyme. But think big and make it available in a way that it's not to most people. I don't want to give the impression that starting a biotech and getting it all the way through to sale like we did with Pfizer is a walk in the park. It's not. Uh, it's a roller coaster ride. And there are times when you have no money left and times when things are exploding and times when things are falling apart and you're fighting with your VCs. This is not for the faint of heart. But if you keep your eye on where you want to go, you can do it. Artist, musician, influential scientist, entrepreneur, public speaker, science policy resource, there's an endless number of things you can do. So my question that I ask everyone um, that I've interviewed, the last question that I usually ask them is, if you couldn't be a scientist, what else do you think could keep you, could have kept you engaged for a lifetime? You know, I, I have to just give you an honest answer here. There are many things I like to do, and I love to paint, and I still do, and I love to read. Science is my life. I knew that when I took that first organic chemistry course. And then when I met Colobacter, this bug that Jerry Hurwitz thought I was out of my mind starting with, I just want to figure it out. And there is nothing, nothing that I'd rather do other than my science. And when I do administrative work and I've had offers to run all kinds of things, I couldn't accept that because I could never give up my lab. I think we are all glad that you haven't. <laughs> Lucy, it's been such a joy hearing about your life in science. Thank, Thank you, you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It's been my pleasure.